Okay, so maybe I will stop. So I, I'm really glad to see that so many of you decided to come, despite it's really late, really late in the day. I hope you will find it worth, worthwhile. So earlier today, uh, I discussed um, the space. In particular, we obtained some understanding of this homogeneous space. we saw that this space can be viewed as the unit tangent bundle of a certain hyperbolic surface, except you have to be careful at the elliptic points maybe, but more or less it's the unit tangent bundle of a certain hyperbolic surface of genus zero. Today, or now, um, I will discuss the space where we put a general D instead of two here, and we will have a different uh, way to visualize this space. Namely, we will see that this space with D instead can be viewed as the space of all Euclidean lattices in dimension D, having covolume one. And then I will discuss the geometry of this space a bit. Okay, so I will have the following notation. We let G be equal to SLDR. So it's larger dimension now. This is a d squared minus one dimensional Lie group. And let gamma be the following discrete subgroup, SLDZ, the subgroup of all integer uh, matrices in here. It is actually a lattice, but that is something which we will, I won't exactly prove it, but we will see parts of the proof of the fact that gamma is a lattice in G. It's not obvious. But it is discrete, and that is obvious. And, and also, let x be the homogeneous space here. So g mod gamma equals sldz slash sldr. OK. So the first thing is I want to make precise this claim that this space can be identified with a family of all Euclidean lattices in dimension D. So what is a lattice in RD? This, the following is, you can take it as a definition or you can take it as a fact. Um, so a lattice in RD. And here, RD is also a Lie group with addition as the group operation. And we have a Haar measure, that's Lebesgue measure. And because I have a Lie group here, we have already defined what the lattice is. It's a discrete subgroup such that, such that the quotient manifold has finite volume with respect to Lebesgue. So that's, in that sense, the following is a fact. Uh, so a lattice, or Euclidean lattice, we call all these lattices Euclidean lattices, that is a set of the form. So it turns out that all lattices will have the following form. It's just the set of all integer linear combinations of some given basis of RD. So I write it like this. All integer linear combinations, just to write out explicitly what this notation means, it's the set of all linear combinations like this. Um, where V1 up to VD is some basis so our linear basis of RD okay and, and this is very easy to prove 
um, or I won't prove it at least. Uh, so, it, if, so any discrete subgroup of this Lie group would be of this form, except I would have some linear set of linearly independent vectors, not necessarily a spanning set, so that it might be a shorter sum. But then we, it's easy to get a, to see that the, the co-volume is finite if and only if it's really a spanning set of vectors, so then it's a basis. And okay, and we can easily write out a fundamental domain now also for, for Rd modulo L. So I write it out explicitly. Then the following F, it's, we, we can take the set consisting of all linear combinations of the following form, where now x1 up to xd are arbitrary numbers in the interval 0 to 1. This is a fundamental domain, or we can call it fundamental cell. It's really a parallelogram. Uh, it's a fundamental cell, or domain, or parallelogram of the quotient space, Rd modulo L, or if I should use this type of notation, mod out by the lattice from the left, I would write Rd mod L like this. These are the same because Rd is commutative, so there's no problem. Okay, and uh, the co-volume of this lattice, so in other words, the volume, no, the co-volume of L is by definition the volume with respect to Haar measure, and I've fixed the Haar measure to be the Lebesgue measure. It's the volume of this quotient. That's the volume of any fundamental domain. So it's the volume, in particular, of this fundamental domain. And it's easy to see, or it's known that this volume is equal to the determinant of the... OK, so it's equal to the volume of F, and it's also equal to the determinant of the matrix I get by taking these as row, row vectors, V1, V2, to up to Vd. This is a D by D matrix. So all the vectors, I will view them as row vectors in, in this talk. I take this determinant and I take the absolute value. So that is the co-volume of L. Just to set notation. Okay, and, and maybe a, a picture. If d is equal to 2, then a lattice might look as follows. It could be a set like this. Something, maybe the drawing isn't very good. Then, for example, here v1 might be this vector, v2 might be this vector, and then the fundamental cell would be this parallelogram. Sorry, maybe the picture is too small, but. Okay. Okay, and the, f the first result I wanted to state is that we have a bijection from this homogeneous space X onto the set of all Euclidean lattices of covolume one. So consider the following map going from the homogeneous space to the set of lattices in Rd. Uh, let me call it J if I need it. Um, it maps any point or any coset in X to the lattice Zd G. And this should be understood as what I get by taking all integer vectors, and I, to each such integer vector, I multiply it by g. So it's, by definition, this is this set. I take m g, where m runs through all the integer vectors in Rd. And remember, a vector is always a row vector, so this multiplication makes sense and gives a new vector in Rd. So in other words, this is the standard integer lattice, but then 
to which I have applied the map G, just moving it in some way, point-wise. Okay, so the claim is that this map is a bijection um, onto the set of lattices of covolume one. So it's not onto this set, but onto the set of lattices of covolume one. Okay. And often we will identify X, here is X, we will identify X with this set of lattices. At least in our mind, it's very useful to do this identification often. Okay, so I won't write much of the proof, but it's a really good exercise to do this, and we will discuss it in the tutorial, but just maybe I will talk, say some words about the proof. So first, let's see what this map is. So if I have some G, and I'm looking at the coset gamma G, Okay, what, what lattice do I get? Well, we can name the entries of G by naming the row vectors. So, so, so let V1 be the top row vector of G, let V2 be the next row vector, and so on. And if I do this, then clearly the corresponding lattice or the image under my map, sorry, is by definition ZDG. And if you look at what this is, uh, you carry this out, you get the set of linear combinations, of integer linear combinations of V1 and so on, up to V, VD. So now it is clear that we get the lattice of covolume one, because the covolume, according to what I said there, is the determinant of, of these row vectors, and, and that's just the determinant of G. So that's one fact. And then you have to check that this map is well-defined. So here, if I have one coset, just one point in X, can, that such a point can be represented by many different G elements. But to go from one to the other, you, you multiply by some element of gamma, that would mean that we here insert a matrix gamma in, in, in gamma. And the point is that multiplying ZD by, by gamma from the right gives back ZD. So that's the reason why this is a well-defined map. And then what more? The fact that it's surjective is really clear from the definition, if you look there. And then you have to check injectivity, and that's more or less checking that modding out by gamma is exactly what you have to do in order to, to, to keep track of the non-uniqueness in choosing a basis of a lattice. So that's a good exercise to, to do. Okay, so, so let me stress again that if D is equal to two, we now have two really strong and useful pictures of this homogeneous space X. So if D is equal to two, this is the unit tangent bundle of the modular hyperbolic surface, and it is also the space of covolume one lattices in the plane. And this will be really useful in later lectures. Okay, so I want to discuss, the main topic of the talk is to discuss something about the geometry of this space X. It's a non-commutative, non-compact space, and what does it look like at infinity and so on. But first, um, okay, I want to, uh, do some more basic things. So, first, I want to discuss an extension, a slight extension of, of this. Um, so I, also for applications, it's really useful to have uh, the, the space of affine Euclidean lattices. So, affine lattices in RD. So, I define an affine lattice to be a translate of a lattice. So, an affine lattice in RD is a set L prime in RD of the form 
L prime equals W plus L, meaning pointwise addition, where W is some vector in RD and, and L is a lattice in RD. And we define the covolume, maybe it's not really proper to call it covolume of L prime, but we define it to be the same as the covolume of L. And then the space of affine lattices of covolume one can be identified with a, another homogeneous space. So I just wanted to state this because we will need it in later lectures. So for that, I have to introduce a new Lie group. I will call it G prime here. It's the affine special linear group of order D. Um, and this, this will be the group of all affine linear maps on RD having determinant one, but I define it in a concrete way as, as the semi-direct product of SLDR and RD. And semi-direct product of, of groups means uh, as a set, it's just the Cartesian product, but then I have it to tell you what the group law is. So the group law is that having G1, W1, and, and then having another element, G2, W2, in this Cartesian product, the product is defined to be G1, G2, comma, W1, multiplied by G2 plus W2. And, and this group G prime acts on RD by affine linear maps. Just like G also acts on RD by linear maps. And the action is from the right. I'm multiplying vectors, row vectors from the right by my matrices. So, so the action is as follows, that if I take a vector V in RD, then I, the, and I want to act on it by an element G comma W in G prime, this is defined as V multiplied by G plus W. So it's an affine linear map. Okay, and so I just want to state the analog of, analog of this. Maybe I won't even state it. I will just say it in words. But let's also introduce gamma prime to be the group of integer elements in ASLDR. So gamma prime is ASLD Z. And yeah, to save some time, maybe I just state it in words. So theorem one, uh, theorem one prime, uh, it says that this homogeneous space, X prime equals G prime modulo gamma prime, this can be identified with a set of all affine lattices with covolume one. So I call it, I say equal uh, the set of affine lattices covolume one of covolume one. And the map is the same as here, ZDG, except now G is an element in ASLDR. Okay. So, so we have that out of the way. And okay. And then, um, before I come to the geometry of, of X, I also have to introduce some, some good parameterization of G. And uh, what I will introduce is the Iwasawa decomposition of G. You have already seen this for SLDR, SL2R, and now we'll do the more general thing for SLDR.
Okay. Maybe I can even, you will remember this, I hope. Okay, so, so now I have to introduce some, some subgroups. So just as for SL2, I will let A be the subgroup of diagonal matrices with positive entries. So A1, A2, up to A, D, and zeros of the diagonal. And I will let N be the group of upper triangular matrices with ones along the diagonal. So one, one, one. And then here I have arbitrary real entries here. One, three, and two, three, and so on. But here I have zeros. And all these, yeah, arbitrary real entries. And uh, I will let K be SOD. So the group of all rota rotations of RD. Just to remind you, it's the group of all elements in SLDR such that K times K transpose is equal to the identity matrix. Okay. So it's all rotations of RD. Now, here's the Ivasova decomposition. Um, so what it says is this, that G is equal to N A K. And every element in G has a unique decomposition as a product of elements like this. So, so to state it in more precise terms, For any element in G, there exist unique elements, some N in N, and some A in A, and some K in K, so that G is equal to N A K. And I guess we won't use it very explicitly, but it's also a fact that this map going from the Cartesian product of these Lie groups onto that one, this is a Lee, um, it's a diffeomorphism. It, the, the fact that it's C1 is clear at once, but it's also, also its inverse is, is, seen, is smooth. So both, both ways, they are smooth. Okay, I wanted to say a few words about the proof. This is actually just Gram-Schmidt ortho orthogonalization, or, if you want. But I, I wanted to have it on the board to, to see what it works like. And we will need it later to, to look back at this proof and so forth. So it's maybe an outline. But, um, so let G be given. And again, we, we call the row vectors of G V1, V2, and so on. And the trick now is to apply Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization to, to this basis, V1, V2, up to Vd. So apply Gram-Schmidt the orthogonalization or orthonormalization process to, and I apply it to the the way I've set up things here, it's, I should apply it to the basis in the opposite order. So I start with Vd, then Vd minus 1, and so on, down to V1 in this order. And this gives me, so remember, what, what does the Gram-Schmidt process do? Well, first we take Vd, and this is a basis, since the determinant of G is equal to 1, so it's non-zero. So first, we take Vd, and we just multiply it by constant to get a unit vector. And then we take Vd minus 1, and we add an appropriate constant times my unit vector in order to get the vector which is orthogonal to, to, v, to, the, to Vd. And then we scale it by uh, some, some, some real number to get the unit vector also. 
and then we take the next vector, we subtract the appropriate linear combination to be orthogonal to the previous vectors, and then we scale it by a real number to get a unit vector. And in this way, we will get unit vectors, and they will be mutually orthogonal. Okay, so, so we get, get an O-N orthonormal basis, WD, WD minus one, down to W1, and the, it has the following property. Well, so I can state it in many ways, but I want to state it as follows. The, the, the vector Vj belongs to the uh, linear span of, of Wd, Wd minus one down to Wj. For every j, this is the case. But also, I have control on, on the sign uh, here on, of the wj vector. So actually, vj belongs to the following type of linear combination. You take a positive real number times wj, and then plus some, something in the span of the remaining vectors. So this is true for every j. And this is if in each scaling step, I make sure to scale by a positive real number. Then I get this. OK. And now if I write out this um, fact in matrix form, I get what I want. So I had g equals this matrix. And now I can view this as the following matrix. This is, remember that this is a D by D matrix, and this is also a D by D matrix because I've recorded the row vectors length D. And I get um, what I've written here can be written out as a matrix product. Here I have to just write out the appropriate D by D matrix. And the thing is that, first of all, VD is equal to some positive number times WD. So, so it's just AD, where this is a positive number. And I will have zeros here. And then VD minus 1 is, I have zeros here, except at the next to last entry, I will have a positive number, AD minus 1. And then I have some real, some real number there. And it continues like this. I will have, so I will get an upper triangular matrix with positive real numbers along the diagonal and then some real numbers here. Uh, so, so the point is that these A1 to AD are positive numbers. And then if you look at this, it's easy to see that this is in the product A times N. You, you can easily work out what such products are and so on. And it's unique. And, and this, by construction, it's in K. So I guess immediately it's an orthogonal matrix, but then the determinant also has to be one. Uh, sorry, I, did, I defined it wrong there, but the determinant has to be one because this has a positive determinant and this has determinant one. No, no, no. Um, something is wrong, yeah. So, so I'm done. So this is an orthogonal basis, the orthogonal matrix. That is clear, but it also has determinant one by looking at the signs of the determinants of these. And I made a mistake here. <laughs> well, the, you, of course, what I defined was the orthogonal group. I was going, I should have written also determinant of K is equal to one and not, Ah, it's okay because here, okay, okay, sorry. So I didn't make a mistake. And, and really, everything is clear somehow because I was working inside SL, so, so okay. I shouldn't, I just, yeah. Okay, but that is it. Ah, um, in order for the proof to make good sense, it should be NA. But it's nice to check that the, they, they don't commute, certainly not, but, but NA is equal to AN as a set. So that ends 
the proof of Ivasova decomposition. It is easy to go in and check that uh, we have uniqueness. Okay. Next, I wanted to just uh, say a few words about harm measure on G. So there are many ways to give, uh, to write out an explicit harm measure on D, but they are all a little bit complicated on G. So for us, maybe the, well, one important format will be to write out the harm measure in terms of this parameterization. So I write it out here. And I will not prove it. It's not genuinely difficult, but you have to work uh, a bit with the Jacobians or something. So mu, I will call my, my harm measure mu. And here is one harm measure. By the way, remember that well, a harm measure is unique up to a positive constant, and I should really stress if it's a left or right harm measure, but it turns out for this group, uh, any harm measure is both left and right invariant, so th then I can say just harm measure. And this is fairly general feature in these lectures because whenever there exists a lattice inside G, the harm measure has to be left and right invariant. But okay, we haven't yet proved that G has a lattice. so. Okay, so here's a formula. Um, if I have this parameterization, then a harm measure is given by dn times a certain factor a, oh, I should define a, aj divided by ai. I have to have this product, and, and here I should say that. So a, my ma diagonal matrix a, I always uh, let AJ be the jth diagonal entry of, of A. There, and, and, and then times a Haar measure on, on the group A, which I write out explicitly. J from one to D minus one. I will say a few words about this. And then DK. So, so, so here, DK is some harm measure on SOD. Harm measure on SOD. So, so on K, in other words. I will not write it out explicitly, and I guess we will not really need it very often. We can often work with just some harm measure. And this is some harm measure on the group N. And that is very easy to write out explicitly. I won't do it, but, but in words, you can just take the product of Lebesgue measures with respect to the entries. But it's gone. So, so the product of Lebesgue measures in all the entries will give a, a harm measure on n. And then, in fact, this measure here, dAj divided by aj, product from j going from 1 to d minus 1, this is a harm measure on a. So, so note that when I write like this, these variables are dependent. A is a d minus one dimensional group. So, so AD. AD is equal to one over A1 times AD minus one, if you like. So the product of all entries is, of course, one. So, so in order to make sense here, I should take a product of d minus one Lebesgue measures. Okay, so, so there is this factor arising. And, uh, well, you have to compute it simply. Actually, it turns out that, going back to somebody's question, if you would instead use the parameterization A and K, then we would have the same formula without, without this factor. So it's a bit easier, but, but we often want this parameterization. It has a clearer geometric sense somehow, for many reasons. Okay, I, I think, I hope we can give some good exercise in the tutorial. There are other ways to define harm measure, uh, but as I said, it's a bit difficult. So let me just point out that 
uh, Haar measure on GL, if I have the full general linear group, then it's easy to give Haar measure. Haar measure on, on, on GL dr. If, if I let uh, the matrix in G be, be given, if I call the entries x11, x12, x21, and so on, then simply the Le Lebesgue measure with respect to these variables times determinant raised to minus d gives a Lebesgue measure. So, so d nu g can, the Haar measure on that group can be taken to be determinant of g raised to minus d, and then just d squared dimensional Lebesgue measure. Okay, so, so it's just a remark. And, and when you have this, somehow SLDR sits inside here as a co-dimension one submanifold, and it's not too hard. You, you would like to somehow take a delta function requiring that the determinant is equal to one. And it, you can make sense of that, but I don't want to, to discuss it more now. Say again. On K? No, so I leave that somehow. And it's often possible to just say that this is our measure on, on K. Okay. Okay, so now I want to discuss the geometry of, of X, the geometry of G mod gamma or in other words, the geometry of the, of the space of all Euclidean lattices of co-volume one. So this is a non-compact space, and it's interesting to try to understand what does it look like at infinity. And, well, one nice question is to ask, if you have a sequence of, of lattices of, of, of co-volume one, then when is such a sequence not relatively compact? So, so when is it impossible? When, when does such a sequence tend to infinity? Um, when is it possible to find a subsequence which, which converges to some lattice? And when is it not? And the answer is given by Mahler's crit criterion, which I will say a bit later. But uh, first I will introduce Siegel sets. And somehow Siegel sets give a more precise description of the geometry at infinity than just having a criterion for when we tend to infinity. There are many kind of really different lattices that lie far out in the cusp of, of X. There are many different ways to tend to infinity. So this is captured by Siegel sets. Okay, so. So what, what one would really like to do is, of course, to find the fundamental domain for, would like to find some fundamental domain for, for G mod gamma. And it can be done. I Minkowski mean, has given a precise description of a really a, an exact fundamental domain, but it's more and more complicated to kind of decode it. It has more and more bounding sides and so forth. So we won't go into this. But a Siegel set is a, is a set which contains a fundamental domain. And it has a rather simple structure. So it can often be used if we want to integrate over x, and we just need an upper bound, for instance. Then we can replace it by an integral of the Siegel domain. OK. So I will give a definition. So remember that A is the group of diagonal matrices with positive entries. Now I define the following subset. For any positive number t, let A t be the following subset. It's a set of all diagonal matrices with always with positive entries and with determinant one, such that the i plus plus first entry is less than or equal to t times ai. 
for all i. So when I say for all i, of course it means for i equals 1, 2, 3, up to d minus 1. So if, if t is equal to 1, this is simply saying that the entries should be monotonically decreasing. But uh, I will actually have to take t slightly larger than 1. So it means that the entries are more or less decreasing, but they may increase a little bit, but they, they can't increase much when I go from one entry to the next. Okay. And, um, okay, now I will define a Siegel domain. So for any T positive and any compact subset, so I will call it Fn, any, this is a compact subset of n, I define s with index fn and, and t to be simply the, the product set fn times a t times k. And this is point-wise product, if you like. And, and this makes sense if you remember the, C, the Ivasova decomposition. Because this is a subset of n, this is a subset of a, and this is all of k. So, so uh, it really sits element-wise, so to say, or factor-wise. It sits inside n a k, which we saw was equal to g. OK. So here's a Siegel set. And now, yeah, F N so, comma. Maybe it's uh, I don't know. Maybe it's bad notation to so call it F N. I want to remember that it's a subset of of N simply. I could call it F here. Yeah. And now I will make a specific choice. Uh, but all, any such set is called a Siegel set. And sometimes you actually work with other Siegel sets. But so here's maybe today's main result. Um, if I make the following choice, Fn, or OK, sorry for if it's bad notation. I, I, OK, I won't use any other Fn. So let me fix Fn to be the following. This is a subset of n, and it, I will define it by giving inequalities on the entries. And the requirement is simply that all these entries have absolute value less than or equal to a half. Clearly, it is a compact subset of n. Um, sorry. <laughs> Ij, and this is for all i, j, where it makes sense. And then also, let's take t to be 2 over square root of 3. So I make these specific choices. And then the corresponding Siegel set, I will call s, because I'm going to talk just about this now. So, so s is the Siegel set coming from this compact subset of n and coming and with my specific choice of t. And the claim is that this s contains a fundamental domain for g mod gamma. So in other words, um, if I take gamma times s, pointwise set multiplication, then I get all of g. So any element in G can be written as a product of some element in gamma and some element in my Siegel domain. <clears throat> OK. OK, so, so um, I have several. Before, I, I hope to outline a proof of this. But, but I, first, I will speak about several consequences. Uh, perhaps first, let me note that this 2 over square root of 3 is the same uh, as uh, the inverse of, if you remember the fundamental domain we had when d is equal to 2, we had the for following 
fundamental domain in the upper half plane for, for the modular group acting on the hyperbolic surface. And, and here is minus one half, here is one half, here is one, here is minus one. And uh, so this is a fundamental domain. Now, if you do the translation from this uh, space, uh, well, from, from this subset of G to some subset of the unit tangent bundle, then it turns out that the Siegel domain, which I have here, is exactly the following rectangle. Sorry, it's really a horizontal line going from that point to that point. So, so I over, overshoot by a little bit. And it's the unit tangent bundle lying above that triangle. So it's a three-dimensional infinite rectangle. That is the Siegel domain in the case d is equal, equal to two. Um, if you go from, from the Iwasawa decomposition notation to, to the unit tangent bundle notate picture. And, and the point is that the height of this point here is um, square root of three over two. So, so it's the same as this t if you, if you do it. So that's a good exercise to, to, to do to get some picture of, of the Siegel domain in the simplest case. Okay. And maybe I should also say a word about lattices. So, so we should think, if we think about lattices, what this says is that given a lattice, given an arbitrary lattice, I can represent it by some matrix in G. But if I choose the, represent, the, the lattice basis correctly, then I will get some element in S. And, and I have more than one choices of such lattice basis. But there, the point is that any lattice has some lattice basis such that the corresponding matrix lies in S. And we can call such a lattice basis a reduced lattice basis if we want. So it's not a really well-defined concept. A lattice can have many reduced lattice bases. But very roughly what it means, if I have a lattice and I speak about its reduced lattice basis, such a basis will have uh, the vectors of such a basis will not, will not be unnecessarily long, and the angles between the vectors will not be too small. And you will see more precisely this soon. Okay. So, a first corollary of this, and it's, it's not a trivial corollary. You have to work a bit, but a corollary is that the Haar measure of uh, the quotient space, G mod gamma, this is finite. So gamma is a lattice. I, I promised I would, <laughs> I, had, I haven't proved anything yet, but, but it follows from this that gamma is a lattice. And the proof is by, by noticing or by showing, by working a bit hard and, and showing that the, the Haar measure of this set S is actually finite. So I should write this. So gamma is a lattice in G. Remember that the uh, Haar measure of this quotient is by definition the Haar measure of any fundamental domain for G. And it's a simple fact that any fundamental domain, any two fundamental domains will have the same measure. And now since I said that this shows that S contains a fundamental domain, it, the, the, then it follows that the Haar measure of this must be less than or equal to the Haar measure of S. And now you verify by some work that the Haar measure of S is finite. Then, then we get this. So how do you verify that the Haar measure is finite? Well, you go back to the formula we had for Haar measure, and then you can integrate. That formula is well adapted for integrating over this because it gives the Haar measure decomposed with respect to Haar measures on this. So the, the only difficult thing is to integrate over AT with respect to the measure I wrote out. So it's a nice exercise to show that this D minus one dimensional integral, and now it's a really concrete integral with respect to D minus one variables to check that it is a finite integral. And let me also point out a somewhat stronger fact, and this is really difficult to prove or fairly complicated, I, won't def I will definitely not try to prove it, that actually S contains only finitely many representatives of any point in X. So that is a stronger fact than, than, than the, this. 
at least a posteriori. <laughs> so um, this, for if I take the supremum over the number of point representatives for any coset, this is finite. Okay. So it's just a remark. So we really, this, the Siegel set doesn't overshoot by too much, no matter where on X we are looking. And then, also, I will tell you the answer to the question I threw out earlier. If you have a sequence of lattices, when does this sequence diverge? And when can you find the subsequence which, which converges? Well, the answer is the following. Corollary two. This is also a corollary of theorem three. Mahler's criterion. <clears throat> okay, so in other words, I want to give a, a condition for a given set. If I have some set C, a subset of X, or a subset of G mod gamma, when, is, when does this set C has, have compact closure? And the answer is, that C has compact closure if and only if there is some ball in Euclidean space that all lattices in L avoid, except so, so some ball around the origin that all lattices avoid, except all lattices, of course, contain the origin itself. So, um, or in other words, if there is some lower bound on the shortest, shortest non-zero vector. So in, so, so, so in order to tell if a lattice is far out, at the far, far away, uh, far out in the cusp, you just look at the shortest non-zero vector of the lattice. If that vector is really short, then the lattice is far out in the cusp. So, so okay, a precise statement. Um, so it has compact closure if and only if there exists some positive number r such that um, every lattice um, in the set C, or corresponding to points in the set C, has intersection with the unit ball. This is the unit ball of radius R around the origin, and this intersection should contain no other lattice points than the origin itself. And this should be true for all G, or, or all gamma G in C. Okay, so this is really a pleasant exercise, again, I think, to, to think about when you, when you have given theorem three. So let me just say two sentences or something. So the hard point is, the, the hard part of this is to check that if this condition is fulfilled, so if there is such a ball that all lattices avoid, except for the origin, then I want to check that if I have a sequence of such lattices, I can find the convergent subsequence. And what you do is, for each such lattice, take a representative in the Siegel set. So then we have a sequence of elements in this Siegel set, a sequence of elements here. And now, okay, I, originally I wanted to prove that I have a sequence of convergent elements here, but now I can actually prove that I have a sequence, I can find a subsequence that converges as elements of G, of the Lie group G. And that immediately implies that we converge also as elements of the quotient. And, okay, so, and uh, how do you find such a subsequence? Well, we have compact, when, if you look at the definition of the Siegel domain, I have compact sets here and here, so it's easy to extract subsequences so that I comp converge in this component and in this component. So now what remains to show is that I can find the convergent subsequence here. And, uh, well, then you have to look at the picture. What, what uh, does the lattice look like in terms of these A1 and A2 and so on? And, well, basically, um, AD is the length of more or less the shortest vector of the lattice. So, so well, the point is that I have a lower bound on, on D. All of A, 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 on, on AD. AD is bounded from below by a positive number. And if you have such a bound from below, then these conditions, and the condition that the product is equal to one, 
they imply that I can extract a subsequence which converges, if you think about it. Okay, and now I really don't want to go over time. So I've at least tried to sell <laughs> theorem three, but I've managed to have no time remaining to give the proof. Let me just say, <clears throat> yeah, say, say uh, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I, can, I can begin a little bit. I was going to give a little bit of an outline of the proof. I can maybe say one or two sentences. Um, the first thing to note is that this set Fn is a subset, is a fundamental domain for, for the, well, for the following. <laughs> Let me set gamma n equals the intersection of gamma and n. So this is the group of all upper triangular integer matrices. And then note that if I take pointwise product of gamma n with my chosen fn, the one which I chose in theorem three, this is equal to all of n. And in fact, and this is easy to check by just writing out the product. Um, and in fact, it's a fundamental domain even for the quotient. So, so I have not much overrepresentation except at the boundary. Okay, so if I note that, then I'm looking at the following set, gamma times s. I want to prove that this is all of s. And then I can use, so this is equal to gamma times fn times at times k. But here from gamma I can break out the factor gamma n. This is no more than gamma. And then I use the fact that this is equal to all of n, so I get the following, gamma times n times at of k. So, so now given an element g in the group g, I want to prove, so want to prove that the orbit gamma g meets this set. So I want to prove that for any given g, I can find, I can multiply from the left by gamma and I can fall into this set. And if I interpret that in terms of lattices, if I let L be the corresponding lattice, then what I want to prove is the following. I want to prove that there exists a lattice basis Um, V1 up to Vd of L such that, okay, I'm not doing much, but I'm such that this particular matrix is in this domain, N A T comma K. And okay, I want to what I wanted to give and, and to go back also to maybe motivate some things I said earlier is to, to show you, uh, just point out a geometric, what this means geometrically for the lattice spaces. So we have a given lattice spaces or a given element in SLDR and I showed you how to do the Ivasava decomposition. So if you look back at that proof, the proof was apply Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process to this basis, but backwards. If you go into that proof, then it's, you can read off what it means for this matrix to lie in this set. And I want to just write out what it means. So the thing in, within the box over there is equivalent to the following. It's equivalent to saying that the distance of the vector v i plus one to a certain subspace v i plus two, I will define this subspace soon, that distance is less than or equal to t, the parameter t, times the distance of the vector v i to the subspace v i plus one. And this should hold for all i. 
So this is the, interpreta the geometrical interpretation of the diagonal entry AI. And here, uh, I have to tell you what the subspace VI is. It's just a sp linear span of VI up to VD. And, and, and then also VD plus one is the zero space. So in particular, um, yeah. So when i is equal to d minus one, the largest value, then this distance is just the length of v d. So that length should be less than or equal to t times this distance and so forth. And now the task is to construct su such a basis, and you do it basically by a greedy algorithm. You pick v d to be the shortest vector of the lattice, then take v i v d minus one to be the shortest possible vector lying outside of the subspace and so forth, and you can check that it works. So, so I, okay, sorry for going over time. Thank you.